As far as we know, our universe is a lonely one. We humans drift around in our blue speck of dust, surrounded by vast expanses of, well, almost nothing. But once you get past a few light years of nothing, you'll find stars, more than 200 billion of them. And that's just in our own galaxy. But we're not here to talk about stars, well, at least not yet. We're here to address that loneliness. And what we need for that are planets. Now, planets are in no short supply either. There are conservatively estimated 100 billion of them in the Milky Way, one for every two stars. Of course, not all planets can support life. Many are gas giants, such as Jupiter and Saturn. Those that are rocky are often too hot or too cold, like Venus or Pluto. But the solid planets that lie in the habitable zone are at just the right distance from their host star, shown here in green, so that the surface water is in a liquid state. There are billions of habitable zone planets in our own galaxy, any of which could be just as capable of sustaining life as Earth. Billions are a lot. Statistically speaking, there should be extraterrestrial life forms, enough to expect many to be as or more advanced than us perhaps with technology millions of years ahead of humanities. So why haven't we found them? Where are all the aliens? Italian physicist Enrico Fermi posed this statistical anomaly, and since it has been known as the Fermi Paradox. There have been many proposed solutions to the Fermi Paradox. Some claim that we are under constant alien surveillance, others that as a warring species, we're destined for extinction. But another, equally possible, but a good bit less abysmal, solution is the Matroshka brain. Now, a Matroshka brain requires three main ingredients. Now, I happen to have them right here. The first is a unified, intelligent, type 2 civilization. Preferably with more than four individuals, but it's a start. The second is a Dyson sphere. And the third is a hearty helping interstellar apathy. Now, to understand them, first we must understand the progress a civilization would need to undertake to obtain these ingredients. Luckily for us, there is a way to measure the evolution of an intelligent civilization. The Kardashev scale. Nikolai Kardashev developed this scale to rank civilizations based on how much energy they could harvest and use. He described type 1, 2, and 3 civilizations, each using exponentially more power than the last. Unfortunately for us here on Earth, we fall in the low end of the scale, a measly type Z zero. We're not even on the board yet. To reach type 1, we would have to utilize between 10 and 100 petawatts globally, 530 to 5,250 times greater than our current consumption of just under 19 terawatts. That means that the energy produced by a type one civilization in just two hours could power modern Earth for an entire year. For us to get there, we would have to tap into any and every source of energy we can here on Earth. Natural gas, coal, nuclear power, solar, wind turbines, hydroelectric dams, geothermal energy, volcanoes, earthquakes, waves, absolutely everything. It seems daunting, but we humans have a knack for underestimating our ability to progress exponentially. So it's fair to say that Earth could realistically achieve type 1 status in 100 to 200 years. A type 2 civilization? Now that's a whole different story. 5,250 times as much power wouldn't cut it. 5 million? 5 billion? Still, not even close. 21 trillion times as much power. 400 yottawatts. In one second, a type 2 civilization could power modern Earth for 670,000 years. Now that kind of power just doesn't exist on Earth, but it does exist a mere 150 million kilometers away. Now that's no walk in the park, but on a cosmic scale, our sun is right next door, and it converts 3 billion 600 million kilograms of hydrogen into energy every second. So how can all the energy from a star be collected when it's being flung out in every direction? Well, with something that surrounds a star in every direction. 
a sphere, a Dyson sphere. Now, a shell-like sphere that completely surrounded a star would be completely impractical, an engineering nightmare. It would need to be perfectly centered as to not drift into the star. It would be susceptible to displacement by asteroid strikes. It couldn't be built piece by piece around a star because it would begin uneven and destabilized. Most importantly, it would have to be made of a material of unprecedented rigidity because there simply isn't enough usable matter in our solar system to create a sphere thicker than two or three meters. But physicist and astronomer Freeman J. Dyson never intended for his megastructure to be an actual sphere, but rather a swarm of orbiting solar arrays, sufficiently clustered and layered to serve the same purpose as a complete sphere. The Dyson sphere's panels wouldn't need much of any structural reinforcement, and by the inverse square law, it could rotate closer to the star to collect more energy over a smaller area, and then rotate back out before overheating, requiring less building materials and being less of an ordeal to build. The energy collected would be distributed via lasers to stations in which humanity would live. Artistic renditions of a Dyson sphere often look something like this, but in reality, if it were doing its job, the sphere would look more like this, collecting all the solar energy and essentially blotting out the star. But just how do you go about building a Dyson Sphere? Well, where do you start? Well, with a squadron of planet-dismantling robots, of course. First, a few panels would have to be placed to power them. But from there, they would go on to deconstruct Mercury. Not just building panels from its pieces, but also replicating themselves. And through the solar system, they would tear onto Venus, Mars, the asteroid belt, and Earth, too. The first panels would take months, even years, to complete. But as more robots entered the fray, powered by the panels they built, progress would increase exponentially. And with great power comes... What, exactly? Well, at this point, it depends on what the civilization strives to do. They could pour their resources into expansion, propulsion, Possibly create wormholes, bend space, conquer galaxies, harvesting other stars along the way. A Type 3 civilization. This expectation for intergalactic spacefaring aliens can make us doubt the existence of extraterrestrials altogether. If they can travel to visit Earth, why haven't they? Maybe they can't, or just won't. There's another option. A civilization could abandon its interstellar aspirations, perhaps for cultural reasons, or never having found a way to traverse the light years between stars. They might expand inward instead, creating their own universe, creating a Matryoshka brain. A supercomputer to trump all supercomputers, pumping yottawatts of energy to layers and layers of nanoscale computers nestled within one another. Hence its namesake, Matryoshka or nesting doll. So how do you create a universe? You don't, you simulate one. Even now, virtual reality is a burgeoning new technological field, and people are doing their best to put themselves into new worlds that better interface with their senses. A civilization with the power of an entire star and thousands of years of research at its fingertips could develop entire universes. Universes without all the pesky laws imposed by our own. There would be no intergalactic speed limit, no conservation of mass, no conservation of energy. In a world built of ones and zeros, nothing would be limited. Beings could integrate their very senses into it, perhaps abandoning their bodies and uploading their consciences directly. Their species would cease to be in reality, but they wouldn't be gone just tucked away, living out years of assimilated paradise while mere seconds passed here on Earth. Perhaps we're not that lonely in the universe after all, but we're not really any less lonely for it. Is mankind destined to upload itself into a universe of its own creation? Maybe, if we can all come together as one people. But we're all brought together by the night sky. We all look up and wonder what might be looking back. 
You might be better off looking into the darkness, to the stars that we can't see, to the ones that have been blotted out.